Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Leslie Simon, I'm the department chair for philosophy and humanities here at UVU. And what an honor it is to introduce my colleague, Professor C.T. Nguyen, which I do not pronounce very well, um, to you today. Many of you know him already, of course, either because you've taken one of his classes um, and been moved and elated by the sheer electricity of his teaching persona, at once instructive and performative, an exercise in charismatic smartness. Or you have bumped into him along the UVU corridors and found yourself halfway into an intensive conversation about bouldering or high meat slow cooking before you realize that you know very little about the topic after all and have indeed been swept up in a raucous and tremendously enjoyable discursive experience um, and perhaps also learned something about street food or maybe Alice Waters along the way. Um, or you've encountered his work in the popular media like the New York Times or the Distinguished Forum Eon as tea exercises, again, with verve, intelligence, and wonderful cultural awareness, the role of public philosopher, which he deems to be one of the most important areas of his philosophical career, particularly in the current social climate um, when broad, open discussion of difficult questions is so very necessary. Or perhaps you know that T has published widely in the professional press too, even convincing the oldest, fanciest philosophical journal, Philosophical Review, to publish their very first piece on games. T is a monumentally impressive colleague. He's assistant editor at the uh, main philosophy of art blog called Aesthetics for Birds. He helped found the philosophy of games journal. He has a book due out from Oxford University Press in March called Games Agency as Art, which argues that games should be considered in aesthetic terms without having to be co-opted into dis discussions of the canonical arts. They should be understood, he writes, um, or I'm, this is me paraphrasing him, but I think this is what he writes, as aesthetic practice on their own and as vessels for human agency translated into, into visual, sonic, and filmic form. And maybe most no noteworthy of all, T used to be a food writer uh, for LA Times. Um, indeed, he still writes about food, and I would suggest that you all save his recent article, What's Missing from Food Reviews, for a dull moment. T writes, as ever, again, with verve, energy, clarity, accessibility, about the need for more cookbooks by people he calls attentive home chefs who, unlike their corollaries in Hook Cuisine, actually relate the felt experience of preparing food, narrating the rhythms and patterns of private cooking. Those are his words. He writes on games, echo chambers, porn, monuments as group emotion, cultural appropriation and trust, and he brings his expertise in and passion for these subjects to our students each week at UVU. We're all very lucky. So thank you, T, for talking to us today. I think that's the most nice things anybody has ever said about me, including my own wife in a smart amount of, small amount of time. So I'm like confused and shocked now and I don't know how to talk. Um, so you're all gonna be my guinea pigs. I've been working on a bunch of ideas and a bunch of different papers and books for a while and they're all coming together to an explanation of whatever the fuck is going on right now in the world. Like I don't understand, it confuses me, it terrifies me, like people are angry, people seem to think everyone else is an idiot. I'm trying to understand. So I'm actually trying to write a second book about this and I'm gonna try today to give you the outline of it and see if it hangs together because there are all these pieces. And I'll warn you right now, the pieces are one, numbers and grades. Two, porn. I'm talking about porn for about a third of this. And three, games and gamification. And I'm trying, basically, I'm trying to understand Twitter and Facebook and what they're doing to us. That's the goal. Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about echo chambers and out loud, an online outrage and how angry people are at each other online and how unwilling to listen they are. And I'm trying to understand this effect. So. Here's the big idea for this talk and the thing I'm going to try to get through. I think there's a possibility, first, that we're simplifying our morality and values for pleasure. That there are complex and subtle moral systems that we should be holding, but we've been discovering that if we simplify them, things feel nicer, we feel happier, we feel more smug, we feel more confident, we feel more tight in our communities. And second, I'm worried that outside forces have figured this out and are designing systems to encourage this, to simplify morality and values for pleasure, and they're trying to bait us to get us to simplify our morality and values in the direction they want. So there's an overriding analogy for this, which is basically, look, sugar, it's nice, it's kind of bad for you, companies have figured out how to put extra sugar in certain foods to get you to eat it, right? I'm worried that 
Twitter is brain sugar, and you've gotten addicted to it, and it's basically like, I don't know, what's the worst, like, what is the worst possible, I, for me, it's like Doritos, but it's like engineered, empty calorie deliciousness, and that's the worry about Twitter and Facebook. Okay, so first, echo chambers. So I wrote this thing, you can find it on Aeon Magazine, and I drew a lot from this amazing book from two sociologists, uh, Kathleen Jemison and John Capella called Echo Chamber. That book starts as an analysis of Rush Limbaugh, but I try to generalize it. I think I see echo chambers everywhere in all kinds of political spheres. I think I also see echo chambers like online around things like the paleo diet and CrossFit and breastfeeding techniques. If you're, I'm a parent now, and if you've ever gone online looking at forums about correct parenting techniques, you will find echo chambers, right? So general account. So what's going on on social media? So there are two different things that people have been talking about, and they've often confused very different effects. So I want to be clear about this for a second. So one effect is called a filter bubble. A filter bubble is when you don't hear people on the other side. So you're liberal, all your friends are liberal, you only hear liberal arguments. You're conservative, all your friends are conservative, you only hear conservative arguments, you never hear the other side, right? That's a filter bubble. That's what everyone thinks is going on. I actually think we have evidence that that's not what's going on, What's going on is something slightly different. It's an echo chamber. And this term, which was invented originally by, in that book, used to mean something different, and people forgot what it meant. An echo chamber is a system where you don't trust the other side. Does that make sense? That makes sense? That's a very different concept, right? Not hearing the other side is simply not seeing their arguments. Not trusting the other side is hearing their arguments, but thinking they're corrupted, they're lying, they're misguided, right? So what you should expect is, if you're in a filter bubble, you'll never hear the other side. And if you're in an echo chamber, you will see what the other side says and have some explanatory story. Like they're all in the grip of some elite conspiracy or something like that, right? I think the echo chamber is what's really going on. So here's a definition of an echo chamber. An echo chamber is a social structure where everyone on the inside is taught to distrust everyone on the outside and where anyone who doesn't share your core beliefs is automatically an outsider, right? So these are actually a very old structure. So a lot of people have been talking about filter bubbles, filter bubbles. A lot of those people have been saying it's a new online thing that has to do with the fact of, about how co carefully constructed our social media feeds are. Echo chambers are like cults, right? This is something we should know. We should recognize this. This is the system where you're taught that everyone on the outside is evil and out to get you, and you can only trust people on the inside. So one really interesting thing about echo chambers is they're typically pre-prepared for counter evidence, right? When you're in an echo chamber, you're going to hear people on the other side saying, oh, your beliefs are wrong, oh, your beliefs are wrong. Typically, the way that echo chambers that I've seen prepare themselves for contrary evidence is through conspiracy theories, right? So what you have is something that says, look, let's say I'm, you are all my cult members. I'm the member of an echo chamber, and I tell you, you trust me, right? And I tell you, when you go outside this room, everyone outside this room hates me. They're out to get me. You're on the side of truth, and they're going to tell you that I'm a liar. But that's just because they're in the grips of a conspiracy, right? So here's what happens. I make that prediction, you go outside, you meet people that fit exactly my prediction. They tell you that I'm a terrible person not to get you. And so my prediction is confirmed, and because you're a good scientist, you will increase your belief in me. That makes sense? That's how conspiracies work. Um, so here's the question. That's, uh, that was just a summary of stuff I've written about in the past. You can read that Aeon article about it. Now the questions I'm really trying to figure out are, why are echo chambers and vicious political polarization, why do they seem to be flourishing right now online, right? What's the relationship between online environments and echo chambers? And second, every time you look at an echo chamber, you find this really particular kind of conspiracy theory that says, look, everyone on the outside is out to get us. They're all in it together. Why? What's that relationship? Does that make sense? So those are my, my big questions. Why is it happening now? Why is it happening online? Why do they always involve conspiracy theories? Okay. So... Here's my method. I'm going to ask you all to be evil. Okay? The way to understand this, I think, is to imagine yourself, imagine you are secretly in the background with a very large amount of money and power. And you're trying to manipulate people to believe what you want them to believe. Right? Imagine there actually is a true conspiracy out there. What would their tools be? 
And if we can figure that out, we can figure out what effective manipulative tools might be right now, and then we can look around to see if there are actually any. Does that make sense? So our tool is gonna to be, we're gonna imagine the perfect manipulative tools, and then we're gonna see if that matches what we see in the real world. Okay, so here are the three parts. One, false clarity. Two, porn. I know you're, uh, that's second, so people don't leave immediately. And three, <laughs> games and gamification. Okay, so part one, clarity and false clarity. So this is kind of philosophical thought, so bear with me for a bit. So I'm really interested in the difference between really understanding something and having the sensation that you understand it, right? The difference between actual clarity and this sense of fake clarity. Again, think about this sugar analogy, right? There's nutrition and then there's the fake nutrition. I think often like there's the things that are actually delicious and nourishing and you can feel it, like you know, a good stew that you've cooked all night long. And then there's this thing that's engineered for you to like think it's satisfying, which is like Doritos which is actually hurting you, but it's actually like just optimizing all these deliciousness sensors. Does that make sense? Like it's maxing out this crispy stuff and this salty stuff. So I'm really trying to figure out what that is for your brain, right? What are the Doritos for your brain? That's basically, does that make sense? That's basically the question. What is brain Dorito? That should have been the name of this talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> so here's the problem. Okay, let's go into a little bit of philosophy. So we're limited beings and we need to manage cognitive resources, right? We only have so much time, we have so much energy, we can't ask every question, we can't do every investigation, right? If you've been in a philosophy class, and a lot of you here I know are philosophy majors in a philosophy class, philosophy wants to ask questions forever about why, 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 and you've probably been sitting there being like, but I have to do something, I can't ask why forever, I need to make a decision, right? And that's actually the, the position we're in for most of our ethical and political lives. We can't ask questions forever. We have to vote now, right? We have to choose what to buy now. So we need to know a way when to end our investigations, when to know that we've thought enough, right? So we need a heuristic. We need a quick and dirty tool that tells us, oh, we're probably good enough that we can stop thinking about this and we can start thinking about something else. So here's my proposal. Here's the basic idea. We use the feeling of confusion as the sign that we need to keep thinking about things. And we use the feeling of clarity as the sign that we've thought enough, right? So, but if that's true, if that's right, then the feeling of clarity is an enormous vulnerability in our thought process, right? Because if you can make something feel clear, if you can make it sound clear, then people will stop thinking about it because they think they've understood everything there is to understand. Does that make sense? So, it's kind of, here's my idea. If someone could manipulate the sense of clarity, could get certain things to feel clear. So I'm, again, think about this Doritos analogy. You might figure out that MSG is really satisfying, right? And if Frito-Lay can figure this out and just sprinkle MSG and salt on everything, you'll probably eat more of it, which is true. Right? This is why this stuff is loaded of salt. So the question is, can somebody out there, can a mental manipulator, figure out what the equivalent of salt and umami is for ideas and sprinkle it on? That would be the feeling of clarity, right? If it just feels to you like you get it, then you'll stop thinking about it. You'll accept it. The idea in here is something that it's something like what you might call a cognitive invisibility cloak. So things, the whole idea here is something like, look, if someone can get you to look somewhere, okay, let me step back. You know how mag magicians actually work? Like not like fantasy magicians, but actual stage magicians. They do it by manipulating attention, right? They send signals about what's boring, and they send signals about what's interesting. So if I want to do a manipulation in this hand, what I've learned if I'm a magician is to make this hand really, really exciting and send signals here that this is really boring and you don't want to look at this, right? And so everyone looks at here and they don't see the thing I'm doing down here. The idea is that the sense of clarity is kind of the equivalent of look away from here, right? It's kind of boredom. Okay, so here's a little test run. Here's something we know from science. So science tells us that there's one simple version of clarity that a lot of us actually use. This is a literature called processing fluency. So processing fluency is just how easy it is for you to think about something. Right? If it hurts, if it takes you a while to figure things out, if it's like really slow, that's not, that doesn't feel fluent to you, it doesn't feel quick. But if it, like, if, you, if it just passes through your brain quickly, if your brain recognizes it and moves quickly through it, you have processing fluency. Okay? 
So we seem to use processing, processing fluency as a heuristic for knowing whether things are right or wrong. So we tend to think if we, we were confronted with a belief, a new idea, and it, it's really slow and it's hard for us to understand, we tend to not believe it. And if it moves through our heads really quickly, we tend to believe it, right? There's a reason for this. And the reason is that fluency is typically correlated with skill in an area. So if you've studied medicine for a really long time and you know it really well, the medical ideas will move quickly through your head. And does that make sense? So typically when things move quickly through your head, that's because you have high skill in it and you can probably trust it. When things are alien and new and you're a novice, they move slowly through your head and so you tend to distrust it. But that's not a perfect heuristic. And psychologists have figured out that this is very easy to game. So here's a great one. I, I love this. So you show someone a sentence on one day, and they've never seen it before, and they typically don't believe it. If you show them the same sentence two days later, it seems more familiar to them, it moves through e more easily through their brain, and they're more willing to accept it. Here's another version. This is the creepiest version. The easier to read a font is, the more likely you are to believe what's written, just because it moves more quickly through your brain. In fact, there's an interesting electoral case where someone from one party wrote the candidate in their party in an easier to read font and wrote the candidate in the opposing party in a harder to read font and changed the election outcome. Does this make sense? So that's called, that's, that is the gaming of a heuristic. So we have this heuristic, this quick rule of thumb for telling whether something is right or wrong, how quickly we, it moves through our brain. It works pretty well. But if people on the outside can figure this out, then they can use it to get you to believe what they want by manipulating the ease of readability, right? So this is something that we are familiar with. This is why slogans are exciting, right? Slogans, mottos, things that rhyme, move easily through your head, right? Slogans you hear a hundred times. And one of the things we know is the more someone hears a slogan, the more they tend to believe it just because of repetition. And the reason, the explanation seems to be right now, the more familiar it is, the more it triggers this puristic and the more likely you are to accept it. So what is it? So that's this little thing about how easy something is to read. Now I want to talk about this big idea, right? What is it to understand something? What is it to get it and to really think it's right? So some philosophers have made some comments about this. Catherine Elgin says to understand something is for the categories to shift to accommodate new information. What this means is like, okay, you have a mindset, you think you understand things, you have some categories in your head, and then there's some new ideas that don't fit. You know, don't know where to put them, right? You don't know where to stick them in your explanatory mechanism. When you understand, your system of concept changes, and suddenly there's a place for everything, right? There's suddenly, an, your, the house of your mind suddenly becomes a little bit clearer because now there's drawer space for everything. That's the feeling of understanding. Does that make sense? Everything slips into place. Kvanvik says it's almost the same thing. John Kvanvik says to understand something is see how all the parts fit together, see how they, uh, to see the coherence. There's also what it is to, to actually have an understanding. So Kvanvik says what happens when you understand something is you have a lot of facility with the terrain. You can move around. You can see nodes. You can see connections. You can see new information. What he means is something like, okay, when you understand something, you understand how the parts relate, and so you can move quickly between the parts, right? When you're at one part, you know the other parts that relate. Okay. And Stravin says you have the ability to communicate understanding. When you understand something, you can explain to somebody else, right? When you're a new student, you barely sort of understand, you can't explain it to someone else. When you really get it, you can teach it to other people, right? So, okay. Now let's use all this for evil. Right? So far, we figured out what it is to understand things, and now I want to figure out, use what we understand about understanding to understand how we fake understanding. Right? How do we give the impression of understanding? So we want to create a system that maximizes the feel of ideas sliding into place, maximizes the feel of seeing connections. It maximizes the ability to generate some kind of explanation and it maximizes the sense of being able to explain things to people. That make sense? So if you get all this, then you'll feel like you understand things, even if you don't. So, let's skip this. Here's an obvious one. 
I think we now can understand why conspiracy theories are so popular with echo chambers, right? So conspiracy theories are all consuming explanations that, okay, the real world's super complicated, right? There are a billion people doing a billion things for a billion purposes. It's really hard to understand. To understand, people believe things because they're raised that way, they saw, uh, they saw different arguments for it, but typically a conspiracy theory makes everything a binary, right? When I'm trying to give you a conspiracy theory, it'll probably and bind you into my echo chamber, it'll sound something like this. I will tell you all, look, I'm on the side of right. If you're with me, you're part of the people on the side of good. Everyone on the outside is part of a single conspiracy out to get me, out to control you, right? Notice what happens. If I give you that explanation, now you can run around explaining everything in the world, right? You have a quick and easy explanation for anybody's behavior. Either you're on my side, or you're on the other side. And if you're on the other side, you're doing it for some nefarious purpose. Does that make sense? So conspiracy theory works like this. Here's another one. This is just a bit of a tangent, but I want to talk about this because it has to do with students and you all are students. Um, so I think another version of this is educational assessment and bureaucratic metrics. I'm talking more to the professors in the room. You who are students here are probably gonna be hidden from this for like two or three more years, and then you're gonna be put into bureaucratic hell for the rest of your life, like us. Um, and one of the things you'll find is that when you're in an institution, you have to justify everything you do numerically, right? So when I teach a class, I have to justify it in terms of certain numbers that the university recognizes as justifications. Um, Port, Theodore Porter in Trusted Numbers says that numbers are really interesting. He's trying to explain why we've become such a numerical culture, why we tend to need to justify everything in terms of numbers. And he says that the quantification of knowledge trades nuance and sensitivity for portability and aggregability. Well, that was a lot of words. Let me explain what that means. That means that knowledge not in numerical form is often sensitive about the local situation sees all kinds of little things. And when you put it in numerical form, you lose all this data. What you get instead is the ability to combine numbers and see averages. Let me give you an example that should make sense to everyone. Grades. Okay. There is a world in which there were no grades and no numerical assessments. Imagine this world. Imagine a world in which I, as the teacher, when you gave me your paper, I didn't give you a grade. I just gave you a description of what was good and bad and what you should work on. And at the end of the class, I gave you a description of, look, here are the skills you have. Here are the skills you should work on. If you want to do this kind of thing, you should work on that kind of skill. And there was no grading at all. It'd be really useful to you, right? Like, what's the point of grades? This would just tell you. I mean, here's the thing about grades. Like, look, sometimes I might be teaching a math class. If I'm teaching a math class and I have to give grades, I just have to give grades to everyone. If, I'm, if I don't have to give grades, I can just be like, look, you're not that good at calculus. So if you have a job in the future that cares about calculus, you should study it. If you're not going to use calculus, who gives a shit? Go on with your life, right? I can give tailored, someone's actually clapping in the front line. Um, I could give you, if I didn't have to put things in numerical form, I could give you sensitive, nuanced evaluations tailored to your life. But I can't do that. I'm forced to give everyone a number. Why? So Porter's explanation is that what numbers do is they, here's the idea, they oversimplify things and make things clear in a way that's useful for bureaucracy, but not useful to people. So here's, here's why. Here's the thing. If I'm an administrator, numerical grades are awesome, right? I can summarize you as a single number. If I'm trying to admit you to a law school, I can summarize you as a GPA, your entire life in one number, right? If I'm the US News and World Report and I'm trying to rank schools, I can just sum up the GPAs of every single student and then figure out which college has the highest GPA of an entering class. That's easy. Does that make sense? So here's an idea. What happens in bureaucracies is that we tend to oversimplify and overclarify our values, right, in a way that typically hurts the people being measured at the bottom but typically is very useful to anyone in charge. Right, does that make sense? Okay, so here's a great example. This is one of my favorite examples. This is from Theodore Porter. This is just awesome. So we used to measure land in a unit called the hide, 
It wasn't the acre, it was the hide. And the, have you heard of the hide before? It's an old measure of land, before we made maps on grids. The hide is the amount of land required to feed an average family. So a hide by a river is small, a hide in a forest is medium, a hide on a plain is big, and a hide in a desert is huge, right? Notice this is a very sensitive and nuanced measure. If I'm the king and I say, give every soldier one hide of land, every soldier gets exactly what they need to live, right? But it's incredibly hard to administrate. It's hard for anyone except the people who are right there to know what a hide is. So when we started making maps and grids, we shifted from the hide to the acre or the square mile. The square mile is easy, it's clear, it's easier to organize, right? But it loses all this data. Does this make sense? So here's another idea. That transition is exactly what happened to you when we shifted from quanti qualitative evaluations to giving you a damn grade, right? So, um, by the way, I, I have to say, if any of you are headed to law school, you should read this book, Engines of Anxiety, by Wendy Esplund and Michael Sauter, which is about what happened to law schools when the US News Report, World Report started ranking them. So it used to be that the US, there was no single ranking of law schools. There used to be this thing called Barron's, and it just described each school in textual form, and it talked about the values of the school, and there was no ranking. And then, about 15 or 20 years ago, US News and World Report started ranking everybody, and they typically ranked them in terms of two main factors. One was the LSAT score of the incoming class, and two was the job placement number of the outgoing class, and that's it. So here's what happened. It used to be that different law schools had different missions. Right? Some law schools wanted to serve underserved populations. Other law schools wanted to turn out people, two students, who showed signs of being ethical, right? who would help the world. Law schools can't do that anymore because when they do that, so if you start admitting students for their ethical value, your US News and World Report ranking drops because the US News Report only responds to one thing, which is LSAT scores and employment numbers, right? So the US, see if this makes sense. I'm going to, I know this is nuts. I'm going to put this all together in a moment. So the US News and World Report takes a really morally complex system with lots of values, lots of difficulty, and it puts into one ranking. And that ranking is really clear, right? It feels like you can make conclusions from it. You can say, well, this school is two parts, uh, two steps higher than that school, right? It feels very conclusive. But think about what you lose. So reports are that students, before the US News and World Report rankings came out, what students used to do was think about why they wanted to go to law school, think about the reasons, think about their values, read the descriptions of each different law school's mission, look at what the professors worked on, and then looked at the one that was best fit for them, which required that they think to themselves what their purpose was and why they wanted to go to law school. Now they don't do that. Now they just try to go to the highest ranked law school they can, right? So here's a suggestion. Can you see, can you see the idea? The idea is there used to be this really complicated thing that was much more nuanced, and now someone offered us a much clearer thing, the US News and World Report rankings, and that actually loses a lot of value. It actually is much rich, less rich. As most of the important data is lost out of that thing, but people use it because it feels clear. That make sense? Okay, so to sum up part one, this was the hardest part. Everything is gonna be silly and more fun from here. To sum up, there's a sense of clarity that can be used to end thinking. This is a useful point of vulnerability for thought hacking. If someone wanted to get control of how you thought and what you did, you'd want to use it, and there are two methods for it. Oversimplifying explanations, as in conspiracy theories, and oversimplifying numbers, as in GPAs and clear school rankings. That's part one. Part two, porn. This is what you've been waiting for, I know. <laughs> so this is from a paper I co-authored with Becca Williams, who's awesome. This is also a New York Times op-ed. You can go read this if you want. Um, so, we're interested, sorry, this is the bait and switch. We're interested in porn, not the traditional sense, but the generic sense, which, you know this new usage? Food porn, organization porn, real estate porn, poverty porn, you've read this online, right? Um, there's a great, great TED talk from a disabled comedian called I'm Not Your Inspiration Porn, which you should watch. Um, my wife says that when she's really nervous and like nothing makes sense, she goes on this site called Things Neatly Organized, which is actually that picture, the Q-tip picture is from that site. And it's just 
pages and pages and pages of images like that, and it's called, or people call it organization porn, right? So what does this mean? Here's, uh, we're gonna adapt from a definition, Michael Reyes's philosophy who defines sexual pornography. There's an actual definition, I'm not gonna do that. Here's the simple version. So, the simple version of his definition is to use something as sexual pornography is to look to that thing's represented sexual content for immediate sexual gratification without interest in personal intimacy. Does that make sense? So you're just looking at the picture and getting your rocks off without actually trying to connect to a human being. So, here's a proposed account of generic porn. You use something as X porn, for whatever X is, when you use a representation of X for immediate gratification freed from the typical attending costs and consequences of actually engaging with X. Food porn, you get the immediate gratification without the cost, the cooking, the calories. Real estate porn, you get the immediate gratification of representations of real estate without the cost of buying it and the effort of maintaining it. That make sense? So that's porn in general. So if this is a useful notion, it should help us identify new kinds of porn. For example, sorry, this is my favorite part of the talk. Get ready, <laughs> moral outrage porn. So moral outrage porn is <laughs> engaging with representations of moral outrage for immediate gratification freed from the costs and consequences of actual moral engagement. So. Uh, basically, Twitter and Facebook are at least half moral outrage porn, maybe like 80%. You can make your own estimates. So um, one thing you should think is, okay, moral outrage porn, the idea of moral outrage porn is this. God, I, I coined this phrase. This is my contribution to American society. <laughs> I'm so happy about this. Uh, I'm going to die tomorrow. It'll be fine. Um, so moral outrage so the actual costs and consequences of engaging in moral action are you have to get morality right, which involves nuance, right? Trying to figure out what to actually do. And you have to act from it. If it's moral outrage porn, you don't have to get it right. All you have to do is feel the pleasure. And the pleasures are like being smug, feeling on the right side of things, and you don't have to do anything about it, right? So, so I really want to be clear here. I'm not saying that moral outrage is bad. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking like, I told you to be civil and polite. I think moral outrage is actually vital in the face of injustice, which explains why moral outrage porn is so bad, right? So here's another way to put it. If someone says sexual pornography is bad, they're not saying that sex is bad. They're saying that the pornographic version is bad. I'm saying it's because moral outrage is so vital that the version that gets people to be unmorally nuanced and then not to act undermines the incredible importance of actual moral outrage. So here's something. I don't think all porn is bad, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with using a picture of food for immediate gratification, because it's just a picture of food. You're not hurting the food. You're not hurting the picture. There's no problem. But there's something really weird about using a representation of moral outrage for gratification, right? That's not what morality is for. So here's a crude way to put it. What you're doing is using your moral belief system not for morality, but for pleasure, right? Moral outrage porn, when you use it, you're instrumentalizing your moral beliefs. You're turning it into a mere means to pleasure. Um, let's skip a little bit. So here's, here's one way to track the difference. If you're interested in actual morality, what you should be doing is trying to figure out what's right, being nuanced, looking at the clues, trying to develop your morality. If you're interested in mor moral outrage porn, and you just want to feel the pleasures of moral outrage, what you're going to do is simplify your morality, make it really easy to use, make it apply to a ton of stuff, right? Does it make sense? Make it unnuanced so you can feel, particularly, one of the things I think that happens in moral outrage for long-term addicted users of moral outrage porn is they tend to evolve the belief that their morality is really simple because if you get that, then you get to say the other side is absolutely idiotic for not seeing it, which is really, really satisfying. This is like moral crack. Okay, okay, that's a new phrase. Okay, so I already said that. Okay. So that, okay, so let's put together parts one and two. So let's say someone wants to get you to accept a system and stop, then stop thinking about it. One powerful way to do that would be to create a belief system that condemned in clear and simplistic terms the other side in a way that makes you feel smug and superior, that is, give you moral outrage porn, and then offer a clear and usable explanation of why everybody else was organized and out to get your side, right? That is, 
the clarity part, the fake clarity part. If you put those together, then you have like the most addictive, pleasurable, easy to swallow system. It happens to be morally wrong, but it's really pleasant. So that system would offer you pleasure as a payment for simplifying your moral system and a sense of clarity to get you to stop worrying about it. Part three, games. I'm literally gonna give you an advertisement. This is my book. It's coming out in March, it's about games. I actually started thinking about this stuff out of the game stuff. So I'll give you the quick summary. Basically, I think the games are temporary environments with temporary goals. When you play a game, someone plunges you into an alternate world, but it's not just a world, they give you an alternate self. They give you points and they tell you what to want, right? So one of the interesting things, I'm very geeky, I have a spreadsheet, that details my 300 board games. Now I wrote a book, so I get to call it my research library. But one of the things you find out is, you get together with a bunch of friends, you play a board game, you don't know what you're interested in, you open up the rules and it tells you what you want, right? You open up some rules and they tell you, you're cooperating to beat the pandemic. You're on a team together. You open another one that says, you're trying to kill each other. You open another one that says, you're trying to make the most deals with each other, right? A game tells you what to want and it gets you there by giving you points. Right? Points are an easy way to latch on to what you want. And one of the things we learn, this is the deep thing about games, if you study games, you learn that we have the ability to want anything that somebody tells us to want if someone is willing to give us points for it. Should I see how all this stuff is trying, might connect together? Okay. I'm gonna skip some stuff because uh, I'm running out of time. So actually, no, I'm not, because this is cool. Okay. <laughs> so, so what's the artistic medium of, you know, like the artistic medium of oil, Painting is oil, the artistic medium of film is like people and film, whatever. What's the artistic medium of games? Some people want to say it's the rules, right? But it's not just the rules uh, because, for example, rock climbing is a game. And it's not just the rules, it's actually the particulars of the rock. There is, this is just an excuse to talk about this game. This is a game called Pew 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 Pew. <laughs> it's an indie arcade game. Um, you play that, you know, that dude right there. Uh, it's a side scroller. You have basically two controls. You're either firing a laser at what's coming at you, or you're firing your jetpack and you're going up, or you're not firing your jetpack and you're going down, and that's all you have, okay? That's the game. Uh, really simple except for one thing. You control the avatar together. One of you has the laser control, and the other one of you has the jetpack control. You'd have to coordinate. And one more thing, you don't have buttons, you have microphones. And the person with the laser microphone has to go pew, 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 pew to fire it. And the person with the, God, I love this game. The jetpack control has to go <laughs> And this guy's going, oh my God. Um, and, um, and the hardest part of the game is actually when you play in front of the crowd, the crowd starts to laugh, and then you start to laugh, and if you start to laugh, you can't make the sounds. So this isn't just the rules, right? This is the whole ambient environment. You could say it's the obstacles, but that's not quite it. I think the real heart, this is from Reiner Nitzia, one of my favorite game designers, is that the designer creates the player's motivations. They tell the player what they want in the game. The game designer isn't just sculpting a world, they're sculpting you, who you'll be in the game. Right? And the fact that you can play a game means you can enter into an alternate motivational system. And it feels really good. So I think one of the reasons games are so pleasing is that when you play a game, life is hard, man. There's like a billion things to worry about and a billion different values and people's different values and it's all conflicting and you have to negotiate all this horrible stuff. And then when you play a game, it all simplifies, right? For a little while, you know exactly what you're doing, you know exactly the tools to get there, and you know exactly how well you're doing because someone's giving you points, right? Games are, for the philosophers in the room, I call them an existential balm. They're like hiding from the true horror of like the void of the world, but whatever. Um, and one of the things that makes them feel so good is that the, pr the goals are so damn clear. The goals are clear. So here's another way to put it. Hopefully you can see the pieces coming together. Games tell you what to care about, and we've learned that we can just care about whatever gets us points. This is fine in games, I think, because games are artificial, they're arbitrary, it's a temporary world. Um, but what happens in gamification? When someone simplifies the goals of real life. You've experienced gamification, right? When someone gives you points in life, my suggestion is, 
those points might get you to change what you value without your even knowing about it. Gamification can get you to change the target. So here's a phenomenon. We're coming to the end of this talk now. My God, I'll try to put it all together for you. So call this phenomenon value capture. This happens when your values are rich or subtle, and then you're placed in a social or institutional system that offers you simplified versions of those values, often quantified. The simplified versions take over in your mind, and everything gets worse. Here are some examples. Academic assessment for you professors. Grades. You might come to school worrying about understanding or wisdom. Retweet numbers, Facebook likes, numerical wine scoring, Fitbit numbers, Rotten Tomato scores, maybe money. So here's some examples. You go into school interested in learning, but you leave caring about your GPAs and the rankings of the law, your law school and the US News and World Report lists. You start exercising for health, but you just end up trying to max out your Fitbit numbers. This is familiar to a lot of people. You start trying to control your diet to feel better, but you end up just trying to hit optimum targets for your BMI. You start tweeting for the sake of truth, justice, and conversation, and you end up just trying to get high follower counts and retweet numbers, which means you just aim at viral content. And what we already know is the thing that goes most viral is moral outrage. So notice in all these cases, there's a game scoring mechanism, right? The world is giving you points on something, and because we're so fluid, because we just accept points, we get sucked into it. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is that US News and World Report rankings turn legal education into a game, right? You came in it for other reasons, and suddenly you're forced to play this game. It just sucks on your brain. OK, example, Twitter. I already talked about that. So gamification gets us to instrumentalize our values also. It gets us to change what we value, to simplify it, because it makes life more like a game, and that feels good. OK, so let's put together all the parts. OK, you are now epistemic manipulators again, being evil. If you want to, a system, and you want to build a belief system to get people to believe what you want, and you want it to maximize virality and stickiness, you would want to give it easy explanations for as many phenomena as possible, conspiracy theories, a simplified moral system that condemns everyone on the outside, a like-minded community to increase your satisfaction for being in there, and a gamified system that lets you experience the pure, unambiguous point success when you say things in line with the world view. Does this look familiar? I think hopefully this should start to look familiar, right? So another way to put it is, you want to manipulate the sense of clarity through oversimplified explanations, you want to manipulate people's moral beliefs through moral outrage porn. And you want to manipulate the goal through quantification and gamification. So let me just skip forward a little bit. So here's the basic idea. We've done this little bit thought experiment. We figured out if you want to get people to believe what you want, you would want to instrumentalize their beliefs. right? And here's an easy way to do it. You'd set up an echo chamber. And you'd fill it with moral outrage porn and conspiracy theories. And then you'd put it on a gamified system of discourse. Some way we have of talking with each other that would reward people who reinforce that system and agree with each other by giving them points quickly and pleasurably to give them the sense of winning every time they agreed with each other. And that's what it would look like if you wanted to pervert people's beliefs for evil. Thanks. So we have time for uh, two or three questions. I've got the microphone, so if you have a question for T, please wait for me to arrive with the mic. So who wants to open up? Hey, how's it going, Professor? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Um, I guess my question is, that, like, that was super informative and I'm really happy I was able to learn, but um, well, how do we apply that to our real life scenarios? Like, how, do, how do we fight against something like that? Okay, I think one easy way, so there's heuristics and counter heuristics. So here's what it looks like. I think at one point in our lives, trying to eat the sugariest, fattiest thing was actually a good rule. Back when we were you know, not in cities yet, not civilized, there weren't enough calories. And so there was a basic, simple rule for us to follow. Eat sugar, eat fat, whenever you can. 
At some point, corporations figured out how to game this and give us things that just fit that a little too easily. So I think what we need to evolve is a suspicion towards things being too made to be too tasty. So you know what this is like with food, right? Most of you have probably figured out right now that you taste something and you're like, oh, that's just too delicious. That's just too sweet and salty and yummy and it's just giving me exactly what I want. That's not, that's not good for me. That can't be good for me. I think we need to evolve the cognitive equivalent. We need to start being able to get a sense for what it looks like when someone has tailored a system to give you pleasure for getting your moral beliefs in line with it and be like, oh, that's just a little too much like a donut. That's like a moral donut I should avoid. Does that make sense? So you, you want to be, I think, suspicious of things being a little too intellectually delicious, I think is the idea. I encounter this kind of um, moral outrage porn with the, along with this idea that if you're not outraged, then you're not paying attention. Yep. Or if you're not mad and pissed right. off and out protesting, yeah. then you're actually a part of the problem. Yeah. How do we balance those two ideas in our lives? So one thing I want to be really care about is that position by itself doesn't count as, isn't automatically moral outrage porn, right? Because one thought is that in the face of radical injustice, you should be morally outraged. During the time of slavery, we should have been morally outraged, right? You should be out there. So moral outrage porn, the important thing about moral, moral outrage porn is to look at the larger structure because merely the fact that someone's saying you must be outraged isn't enough to twig to the idea that it's moral outrage porn. No more than the mere fact of nudity is a sign of sexual pornography, right? Sometimes it's part of the healthy thing the relationship. So the same thing with moral outrage porn. You actually have to look at whether there's a long-term simplifying relationship to fight. But, I mean, sometimes it's the other way. I think there's also uh, the presence of, I don't know, I'm gonna call it civility porn, right? People being like, oh, all those people are so morally outraged, we're better, we're calmer, right? That also is a kind of moral porn, right? So the thing, to fight against is the tendency towards simplification, not a particular moral, moral direction. So you're talking about grades in your presentation. I think you had a term for it about like the way that it could be. Right. Do you know, is there any like big steps going towards that way where? No, everything is turning more quantified. <laughs> uh, the grip of the world it, the grip of institutional bureaucracy on the world is getting worse, and I see, uh, I have not seen any convincing movements away from that, and if you want to understand more, I recommend James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, which is about the inevitable tendency towards uh, clear, quantified uh, justifications for all aspects of human life. Sorry, it's terrible. Sadly, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking T.